On Sunday nights, I am trying to explain the book of Revelation. That's a very uh, profound statement. Uh, It's not something you actually explain in a few minutes or moments, and you don't really explain it all. What you do is you teach on it, and there's so many aspects to it. There are no exact ending answers. And when I say ending answers, you don't say something in Revelation and you've explained it fully and you've come to an end of its explanation. You simply study this book for a long time and the more you study it, the more things you see in it. Now, we got into the book of Revelation due to the fact that we were studying uh, the kings of Israel and we got down to uh, Jehoram Uh, who was the king of northern Israel and his confrontation with Naaman, the uh, commanding general of, of of Syria, and, of course, how he came down to Israel. And Elisha told him he had to be dipped seven times to be cured of his leprosy. Now, all through the scriptures, leprosy is always a type of sin. Seven is always a type of baptism. And I've been putting this on the board each week that you've got some words for seven. You have this word, and of course that's what Revelation is about, is about the number seven. Seven is probably one of the most significant numbers in all of the Bible. And you've got these words right here. You have the word Shabua, S-H-A-B-U-W-A. And that word Shabua is the word seven seven or it is the word weeks it's the same word that you find there in Daniel 9 24 where Gabriel comes to Daniel about this time of the evening oblation and says 77s are determined upon thy people it is the word sevens and then of course it comes from another word that sounds and spells similar or it is the word Shabua, S-H-E-B-U-A-H, S-H-E-B-U-A-H. And that word Shabua, that word means to take an oath. And of course, when you get into sevens, you're talking about taking an oath to God. When you take an oath, that is our part of a promise to God or it's our part of a contract. When you have a contract among uh the Jews, early Jews, ancient Jews, or among the people of today, you've got a contracting party. You've got the stronger the parties. If you go out to buy a house, you have the contracting party. You actually have the stronger the parties is the owner of the house. And then somebody comes in and makes an offer. Well, you have to have a meeting of the minds and the buyer signs his name on the contract, and then the seller. Everything depends on what he's willing to do. And the contract depends upon the seller. Sometimes when you go back and you don't like the contract, you don't like certain things that are stipulated, uh, if, if the seller don't like things that are stipulated, he'll go through and he'll cross things out and put the number that he wants in there, and then he will initial that right there, And then he'll go back and sign his name on the contract. Well, when we take an oath, that's what this is talking about. It's talking about a contract had to be signed by both parties. And the stronger of the two parties was the one who stipulated the final rules. Well, of course, the one who is the stronger of the two parties is not us. It's God. He sets down the laws, and there will be no changes in his contract. And the way we sign the contract, we circumcise ourselves and now circumcision is not literal but it's of the heart and that's not something we can do the scripture says God will circumcise us so we sign our contract by uh, stipulating uh, by putting our name on the line and that's when we cut off self And we say, whatever the party, whatever the contracting party who is God, whatever he says, that's what I'll do. But we can't do that willingly ourselves. That's called predestination. God has to work in us 
to will and to do of his good pleasure. So that would be taking an oath. It's when we circumcise, and when you go back to that uh, 17th chapter of Genesis, when God comes to Abraham and he says, Abraham, I'll be your God, you'll be my people, and you'll circumcise the foreskin. Well, we know when we're studying the shadows that... Uh, that uh, circumcision is now spiritual and that's how we sign the contract of God when we cut off self completely and we lay our lives down that's when we take an oath or you might say we become as a, another word Shabbat S-H-A-B-A that word there is one of the words for uh, it means to be complete to be complete, or it means to seven oneself. Oneself, and this word Shabbat is, it's related to these two words. It comes from these words. So seven and oath are promising to God uh, that we will be his people, but it's something he has to do in us because there's none good. That actually takes us back to predestination and the sovereignty of God. This means to seven oneself or feed to the full. That's what it means. That reminds me of the verse in Hebrews, the fifth chapter, where the Bible says strong meat... Strong meat belongs to those who are of full age. And that word full age, that means to be grown. When you're grown, uh, you are full age and you are completed. You're complete. And that's what this in the Old Testament means. To be completed is the word Shabbat or to seven oneself. It means to grow up and to become a full age. And when you're full age... That's when you can eat strong meat, or the word strong there is the word S-T-E-R-E-O-S, stereos, it looks like stereos, but it's stereos, and it means stiff meat, that means beef steak. And the whole context of that fifth and sixth chapter is talking about whether we're to be drinking milk or eating beef steak. So beef steak belongs to those who are grown up and they're full age, and they have been sevened. So when we get into this, into this being sevened, as, and these are all direct derivatives of the word seven. When we are sevened, we are, uh, we are being finished in our life. God starts off with an immature believer, immature believer, and all of our whole life, all the fiery trials we go through, the divorce you go through, the nervous breakdown you go through, uh, all of the uh, getting fired, losing your job, breaking your neck, all of this, losing your car, this is being sevened in the life of the believer, and it takes up that to make us grow up and become a full age and to be completed in Christ, and that is a blood baptism also. These are many ways of saying the same thing. And what we're doing, we're talking about the book of Revelation because you've got so much that has to do with being completed because seven is the prominent number throughout the book of Revelation is what it is. Now let's go back over here, and we've I've written this up on the board. I... Don't think I'll write it on the board this week. I'll just, well, I will too. I'll go ahead and do it. it. won't take long to do it. In the book of Revelation, you got seven churches. Churches, seven spirits, seven angels, seven trumpets. And as we go through these, remember... The seven spirits, the word spirit is P-N-E-U-M-A, pneuma, and that is the word breath, breath, and to be sevened uh, with the Holy Spirit, which is the truth, which is truth, to be sevened would be to go through a blood baptism, be completed, and to be sevened or filled to the full, it would have the idea of being filled with the Holy Spirit, are filled with the truth. Now, you don't get filled with the truth just one day. You, ha you become filled with the ability in your heart to understand the truth. We all don't understand all the truth all at once. 
But all believers have the potential to understand more truth as you're growing up and as you go along. Well, you got seven angels, and remember the word angel is just the word A-G-G-E-L-O-S, and that is the word messenger. And if we are messengers of God, then we are being filled with the truth, and we're speaking as God's angels or His messengers, and we are being sevened. As I've said, think of that word seven as an adverb or an adjective, a descriptive word more than just a numerical number. Think of it as being sevened. Every one of us are being sevened as we live our lives because we're being blood baptized or we're being completed or we're being filled or we're going through this or we're signing the contract. We don't sign the contract one day. If It's like this. Here's kind of how you're signing the contract. Here's the beginning of your life. And God says, sign the contract. And you say, yes, Lord, Jim Brown. And it's time to die after you get it signed. Right? You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like you're signing your whole life. You're cutting off self. It's what you're doing. That's what this is about. And let me erase that. I've made a mess of that. All right, now. Isn't it amazing how... And when you're studying this, this is abstract terminology. That's the way they thought. And people say, why don't make no sense to me? We don't think like that. That's right. But they did in the first century. Then, of course, you have seven angels, seven trumpets. And remember... Uh, remember, the trumpets are equated with voices. We've already gone through that, but we'll bring that out some more along the way. And then seven candlesticks, seven candlesticks. And remember that the seven candlesticks are the seven churches of Asia. Now, there's the church is not local. The church is international. The church is the wife. It is the body of Christ. It is his bride. And that's not just some local church over here. So seven churches would be a sevened church. One that's being perfected. One that's being uh, made to be filled to the full. And then you got seven stars. Seven stars. And, of course, when you think of the seven stars, that's in the right hand of Christ. And the Bible says in that 20th verse of Revelation, the first chapter, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. So it would be seven angels or a sevened, a sevened spirit, a sevened messenger with the truth in them. That's what it would be. Uh, so you got seven stars... Seven seals, we're going to look at those tonight. Seven seals, seven horns, seven horns. And always remember, horn uh, was a term among the ancients. It meant power. That's what the word means. You remember there in that first chapter, at the end of the first chapter of of Zechariah, you could look at that very quick like. Zechariah, this, the first chapter, the last two verses, and the Lord showed me four carpenters, then said I, what came these to do? And he spake, saying, these are the horns, these four carpenters are four horns, which have scattered Judah. Well, after Judah was scattered by Babylon, what else what other uh, horns besides Babylon exerted their power over Judah? Babylon, then Persia, and Greece, and then Rome. And this is the world beast system, and that's what this is talking about when it says, These are the horns which have scattered Judah, so that no man did lift up his head. But these are come to fray them, to cast out the horns of the Gentiles, which lifted up their horn over the land of Judah to scatter it. And of course, he's talking about here, 
uh, at this time in Zechariah. This is when the book of Zechariah was around, written about 520 B.C. And that was about the same time that that was the same time the Persian Empire was ruling. And he's saying this horn has overthrown the one that has scattered Judah, which was Babylon. And then, of course, you've got seven horns and uh, seven eyes. Seven eyes, and that means to be uh, full of wisdom. And, of course, seven means to be completed. And then you've got seven thunders, seven thunders. And then you've got seven heads, seven heads of the, of the uh, beast. And you've got seven crowns upon the seven heads. And which denotes rulers or authority. Then you got the seven last plagues. And the seven last plagues are going to be poured out of the seven golden vials. Golden vials full of the wrath of God. And then you've got seven mountains upon which the woman sits in a mountain was a head or a ruling city of an empire. It was a capital city. So you got seven mountains upon which the woman sat, and you've got seven kings. Now, as we go through this, we're going to try to see as much of this as we can. But I And I'll be commenting. Sometimes I don't know any other way than just go straight to something. You can... You can talk and tie these things together for a long period of time, but you can never really get all of it said in one message. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to stop and go over here to this. We've been talking about how the book of Revelation is not a sequence of events. It's not... Uh, well, this event's going to happen at the end of time, and then this is going to follow, and this is going to follow, and this is going to follow that. And these are going to follow on the heels one after the other. That is not what the book of Revelation is. These are different. If I look at the pulpit from over here, and then I go over here and look at it from over here, I can see something different. And it's like looking at, it's like looking at things that are happening at the end of time from different viewpoints is what it is. Because you've got the end of time. You got the end of time in these chapters. In Revelation 6, Revelation 6 we see the end of time where the great earthquake comes and, and men uh, hide themselves in the rocks and the mountains and pray that, uh, that God will come and, the, uh, and hide them from the face of him that sits upon the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb for the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? Well, that sounds like the end of time to me. And you got the end of time here in Revelation 6. And then you've got the end of time in Revelation 8. Now, it's not as obvious in Revelation 8 because in Revelation the 8th chapter, where you see the end of time, you see chapter 8, verse 8, and you got seven angels with seven trumpets. If you got seven angels here... You've got the spirits of the seven churches because you cannot forget the last verse of first, uh, uh, the first chapter, the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand. The seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches. Well, it's just a refined church. I keep saying it's not like it's seven different candlesticks. I've got this candlestick here, and this is not seven candlesticks. This is one lamp. It's one menorah, and, but it's made up of seven arms here, and each one of them has a light, and that's what we are. This is the church. The oil in, the, the oil in here is the Holy Spirit. So it's just one candlestick is what it is. It's actually one menorah is what it is. And uh, so it's not actually speaking of seven churches. It's speaking of a refined church, what it takes to become refined. Well, in Revelation 8, uh, just very quickly, Revelation 8, and down here in verse, uh, in verse 8, the second angel sounded, 
and as it were a great mountain burning with fire. Now, you can match that up with the 18th chapter of Revelation because the, uh, you have to go back to various verses over in the 51st chapter of Jeremiah. The scripture says Babylon was a proud mountain, proud capital city, and that God said, I'll make her a burning mountain. And we see the merchants of the earth, if you want to flip to the 18th chapter real quick, to the 18th chapter, and we see here in verse 8, Therefore shall her plague, speaking of Babylon, come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her, and the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously are in a strain. That word deliciously is strainos. S-T-R-A-I-N-O-S. It means in a strain. And when you live in Babylon, or let us make us a name, or self, you're living in a strain. Uh, the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived in a strain or deliciously with her shall be well her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. And you look back at the 51st chapter of Jeremiah and you match all this up. What you do is you match, uh, when you're studying Bible, you're matching verses with verses particularly Revelation, you're studying Bible and you're proving Scripture with Scripture. And when you go back to Jeremiah, 51st chapter, 51st chapter, when he says, uh, let me see here. Okay, when he says over here, when I say God called Babylon a proud mountain. Well, he called her proud. And of course, let us make us a name is proud, isn't it? She always has been proud. And that's the system of wealth and self and sin and stuff. It's the system of Christ's mass. Uh, in verse 29, Call together the archers against Babylon, all ye that bend the bow, camp against it round about, let none thereof escape. Now this is the destruction of the first Babylon on the Euphrates River. Recompense her. In fact, read the 50th and the 51st chapter of Jeremiah and you will see the destruction of the first Babylon. She had walls that were uh, 450 feet high. She had a moat that was about 400 feet deep. It looked like in the, the one side of the wall was 14 miles wide. When you came across the desert, you saw something that looked like the biggest skyscraper you ever saw in your life. And he recompense her according to her work, according to all that she hath done. Do unto her, for she hath been proud against the Lord, against the Holy One of Israel. She's been proud. Verse 29 of chapter 50 of Jeremiah. Oh, did I say 51? For she hath been proud against the Lord. That's the very end of verse 29. She hath proud and been proud against the Lord, against the Holy One of Israel. Verse 30. Therefore shall her young men fall in the streets, and all her men of war shall be cut off in that day, saith the Lord. Behold, I am against thee, O thou most proud. Talking to Babylon. Saith the Lord God of hosts, for thy day is come, the time that I will visit thee, and the most proud shall stumble and fall. Now he's calling Babylon proud there, isn't he? And none shall raise him up, and I will kindle a fire in his cities, and it shall devour all round about him. Notice that this is a mountain. It's a capital city. God says it's proud, and God says I'll burn you. And if you look over at the 51st chapter, 51st chapter, verse 25, Behold, I am against thee, O destroying mountain. This 50th chapter and 51st chapter of Jeremiah is about the destruction of literal Babylon. The one that began in Babel. Behold, I am against thee, O destroying mountain, in verse 25. God calls her a mountain, says she's going to be a, she's a destroying mountain because she destroys all the other capital cities and mountains of the earth. Saith the Lord which destroyest all the earth, and I will stretch out mine hand upon thee, and roll thee down from the rocks, and will make thee a burnt mountain. Well, when you go back to Revelation, 
You go back to Revelation 8, and he says in verse 8, the second angel sounded as it were a great mountain burning with fire. That's Babylon. So when Babylon goes down, the 18th chapter is a chapter that's about the destruction of Babylon. So you can just draw a little uh, note right out beside verse 8, chapter 8, Babylon. So we have the end of time in Revelation 8. We have the end of time in Revelation 10. And I'm still telling you that these are simultaneous it's, you wouldn't call them simultaneous. It's the same happening from a different viewpoint. That's what it is. You're looking at it. Well, when you see the end of time, then you have the end of time in Revelation 10. You know what this is about? I like what Mr. Uh, what this is about. Mr. Patrick Fairburn says in his book on Revelation God is using John to pen a book that's similar to a political cartoonist. When you see a political cartoon and you see a big elephant kicking this donkey off the White House steps, what does that mean? That doesn't mean that's a donkey, and that does not mean that's an elephant. That means... Elephants represent Republicans. Donkeys represent Democrats. That means, what that means is that the uh, Republicans have won the White House again and they've kicked the Democrats out. That's what it means. Or vice versa. He said this painting, he said the writer of this book has painted, painted a picture just like political cartoonists. When you see a dragon with seven heads and ten horns, it doesn't mean it's a little dragon. Seven heads are mountains upon which the woman sitteth, but mountains are capital cities. And the woman is that great city that reigns over the kings of the earth. Well, who is that? It says that's the last verse of the 17th chapter. And in the fifth verse of the 17th chapter, it says, Mystery, Babylon the great, the mother of all idolatry. So it's talking about this is metaphor. This is allegorical language. I like what Patrick Fairburn says. It is like a political cartoon. Everything represents something. And that's what you have to get to if you don't know what mountains are and you don't know what horns are and you don't know what candlesticks were. You're just going to be lost. First of all, you've got to define for about 10 years in the book of Revelation, sit around defining words and looking what culturally what they meant when they said something and then get into studying it. You've got to start off by knowing what sevens are from the Old Testament, don't you? If you don't know what sevens mean, and there's not a scholar alive, liberal or conservative, that will argue with you about the word seven meaning to be complete. Everybody will say that. Now, so here in the 10th chapter, you've got the end of time. Verse 5, the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things that are therein, that there should be time no longer. I think that's the end of time, isn't it? So Revelation 10 is the end of time. And, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, you got seven angels with seven trumpets in Revelation 8, 9, and 10. Of course, you've got the first trumpet in verse 7 of chapter 8, the second trumpet, verse 8. The third trumpet, verse 10 of chapter 8. The fourth trumpet, verse 12 in chapter 8. The fifth trumpet, verse 1 of chapter 9. The sixth trumpet, verse 13 of chapter 9. And the seventh trumpet are the last trump. And we're going to be changed at the last trump. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. There's your time factor. Time element. Last trump. Well, you've got seven trumpets here, 
And in Revelation, in the Matthew 24, uh, starting in verse 29, after the tribulation of those days, the Lord shall send His angels with the great sound of a trumpet. Well, the last trumpet hasn't sounded before the trumpets at the end of time. Therefore, we're not going to be changed in a pre-trib rapture. We're going to be changed at the last trumpet. And here it is right here. When Christ puts one foot on the land, the other on the sea, and says, Time will be no more. Then he says, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. When you go back and study the third chapter of Ephesians, the mystery of God is that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body. There's one body, that is the church, the wife, the bride of Christ at the last trump. So the mystery, you got two mysteries. You got the mystery of iniquity and the mystery of God. And it's not going to be a mystery when Christ comes back and he pulls the cover off and reveals everything about the truth. The mystery of God should be finished, and that word finished is the word teleates, or T-E-L-E-I-O-S. comes from teleos. It means complete. The church will be complete at the sounding of the seventh trump. And one other thing sounds at the seventh trump in Revelation 11 and 15. So you can say when the seventh trump sounds, it's the same seventh trump of verse 7 of chapter 10, isn't it? Yes. So you've got the end of time in Revelation 11 because the seventh trump sounds there in verse 15. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. That verse there means He's taken over all kingdoms and nothing else will ever rise up against Him again. Forever and ever is an old ancient term. It means from now on. Satan's not rising up after this. There's not going to be a... uh, a thousand year reign after this is all over and we'll hit that too as we're in this. Now, so you got the end of time in chapter 11 and chapter 12 is a panoramic view. Pan means to cover all. Pan was the God of all. They called him all in all, Pan. So when you pan, you look at the whole picture. Chapter 12 is a panoramic view of all time where we see Israel giving birth to the man-child who will rule with a rod of iron. And Israel is the church and she flees into the wilderness. This is an overall view. Then in chapter 13, he describes the beast world system. Chapter 14, he starts off talking about the 144,000, which I'll address in a few moments. 144,000, but at the end of chapter 14, you've got the end of time. The end of chapter 14 is a synonymous view. It's another view of Armageddon. Revelation 14. These are just different views. Revelation 14 we see in uh, verse uh, 15, another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice, to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in thy sickle and reap. We, we see in God gathering in the sheep and the goats in the 25th chapter of Matthew. And he's going to gather the wheat and the tares out of the 13th chapter of Matthew. And he's going to separate the wheat from the tares. Now, when does this happen? When does the, when does the gathering of the, of the tares and the... And the wheat begin. Well, it, be, it, it begins, it begins at, well, at the month of Nisan. This is when they begin to, this is the crop season. That's March, April, March, April. And then every month for seven straight months, for seven straight months, you've got At the beginning of each month, you have got a new moon festival, a new moon, and at the new moon festival, you've got a sounding of a trumpet, 
a trumpet, and that goes on for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. In the seventh month, that's Tishri, or Tishri, however you want to pronounce it, and that is also the feast of in gathering. That's when the final crops are gathered in. That's our month. Uh, September, October, and we know that's the end of the harvest. You don't have to be a genius to know that. Your tomatoes quit growing at that time, don't they? Or they quit getting red and they get uh, shriveled up on the vine. So this is the end gathering, and that's what he's talking So the end gathering, at the sounding of the seventh trumpet, that's the end gathering. That's going to be the same time factor. You've got to look at time factors. This is the same time factor in Revelation 14 as you find at the seventh trump. Because when they sounded the seventh trump, that was the beginning of the seventh month or the seventh moon. That was called their ecclesiastical calendar. They had a seven-month calendar religious calendar. And at the seventh month, they would sound a trumpet and they would gather in the crops and they would put the sickle into the field to gather in the crops. Let's read this. Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come. This is verse 15 of chapter 14. And this is the end of time too. And he, he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped, the wheat and the tares, the sheep and the goats. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in the heaven, he also having a sharp sickle, and another angel came out from the altar which had power over fire and cried with a loud voice to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. Well, he's talking about how that they would tread the wine press and how the grapes are ripe and it's time to and of course they would get inside the wine press and tread the press and there'd be a hole over here where that the fruit would go out and go into a, a vat over there the the grape juice and the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great wine press of the wrath of God. This is equivalent to Armageddon in verse 16 of chapter 16. This is just another picture of Armageddon. And the winepress was trodden outside the city, and blood came out of the winepress even unto the horse bridles. Now, there's not enough blood in the world to fill up a valley, uh, a long, deep valley, to come up to, to the bridles of the horses. What it's talking about, like most of the writers say, the blood will splatter that high is what it will do. It will, he's trying to illustrate a bloodbath that God's going to bring on the earth. Even unto the horse bridles by the space of a thousand six hundred furlongs. Now this is, of course, you can go back to the valley of Jehoshaphat there in Zechariah. And well, we can look at that real quick. Let's look at that. This is equivalent. This is also an equivalent. Go back to Zechariah. That's your next to the last book of the Old Testament and we're not going to get I'm just simply showing you that this is a this is a view of of what's going to be happening here at the end of time when you get back over here to Zechariah the 14th chapter uh Fourteen, Yeah, 14. All right. And this shall be the plague, verse 12. This shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet. Their eyes shall consume away in their holes. I don't know if this is going to be some great explosion. One thing for sure, it'll be God exploding. 
I've had people say, well, this is a nuclear explosion. How about just the eyes of Jesus coming back and destroying them? And their tongues shall consume away in their mouth, and it shall come to pass that in that day that a great tumult from the Lord shall be among them, and they shall lay hold every one on the hand of his neighbor, and his hand shall rise up against the hand of his neighbor. And Judah also shall fight at Jerusalem, and the wealth of all the heathen round about shall be gathered together, gold and silver and apparel in great abundance. And this is, of course, this entire book of... Uh, Zechariah is talking about the very end of all things. And you also have this over in the book of Joel. I'm not going to take time to go there. That this is uh, the great valley of Armageddon when it's going to be fought. Now, let's go back over here to Revelation. I shouldn't be wandering all around. Uh, Joel 3 and 13 speaks of it'll be a battle in the valley of Jehoshaphat. And we don't know exactly where the, the valley of Jehoshaphat is until God cleaves uh, a place in the Middle East. And of course, I believe it's more spiritual than it is literal. I don't even have time to go there. But if you look here in chapter 16, you've got the end of time here because you've got the seventh angel, which is the seventh angel sounding the seventh trumpet in verse 17. The seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great... Well, I should read verse 16, because this is Armageddon. Let me read 16. And he gathered them together in a place called, in the Hebrew tongue, Harmageddon. Or the, uh, it's a mountain. Har means mountain. Megiddo is a valley of the mountain. It's where it's been split. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air. Remember, the seventh angel sounds his trumpet. And the sounding of the trumpets, we've, you've got seven trumpets sounding. And then you've got seven vials or seven goblets being poured out upon the earth. This is drinking the cup of the fury of the Lord. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake. Here's the same earthquake you see all through the book of Revelation. It's not talking about a literal earthquake. Literal earthquakes can be involved, but it's talking about some great disaster, or some financial earthquake probably. Such as it was not since men were upon the earth so mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. What mountains? Capital cities, heads rulers of the world. They're not found anymore. God's going to destroy it all. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. And here's the end of time also. And then you find the destruction. That's in the 16th chapter. So you got Revelation, the 16th chapter, you got the end of time. And then then you have Revelation, the 17th chapter, which is description of Babylon. That's just a description of who she is, to describe who she is. And then Revelation 18 is the end of time, where we see Babylon being destroyed. It's a very graphic description of her destruction. And then Revelation 19, Revelation 19 is also about the end of time because we see Jesus coming back on a great white horse and his eyes were as a flame of fire in verse 12 and he had a vesture dipped in blood, verse 13 and his name is called the word of God and the armies of heaven followed him with they were clothed with linen, uh, fine linen, white and clean and a sharp sword goes out of his mouth in verse 15, and he treads the winepress in verse 15. He treads the winepress, the same winepress of, of chapter 14. 
the same wine press as the Battle of Armageddon in chapter 16. Chapter 16 and verse 16. He's treading the wine press uh, of the fierceness of the wrath of God, and he's got upon his vesture and on his thigh a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Uh, and then he sees an angel come and tells the birds of the air to come and eat the flesh of kings and drink their blood because I've prepared this great feast for you. So that's the end of time too, isn't it? Now, let's just go back and let me address some things and I don't know any other way than to just go do it. Now let's go back over here to the seventh chapter. We talked about the sixth chapter being... The end of time, but it, the sixth chapter begins with the sixth chapter begins with four beasts opening the first four seals, and these seals are they're an official seal. Uh, let me give you this word seal. It's the word sphragis, and the seals remind me of the marks. Let me give you this here. The seals. Uh, you got uh, the seals. Let me write these down for you. You got seven seals opening the book of God. Now, gosh, I want to go back to chapter 4, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, Christ has got a book in his hand and it's sealed with seven seals. He's also got seven stars in his right hand. The right hand is the hand of authority. Jesus will sit at the right hand of the Father until he makes all of his enemies his footstool. Well, it, that doesn't mean the Heavenly Father is sitting on a great big throne and he's got a great big long beard and here's the prince sitting here looking regal and all. Right hand simply means authority. It is an idiomatic term. You have to get that in your mind. So in the right hand of Christ, he's got seven seals. Or he's got seven stars in the first chapter, which are the seven spirits of the seven churches or the seven angels of the seven churches. And then he's got a book with seven seals in his right hand here, which appears to me that the book, which is our hearts, it's written on our hearts, because the sons of Aaron or the 24 elders aren't able to open this book because it's written in our hearts. They ministered in 24 courses to the, to the temple. They ministered there and they interpreted the book of the law that was inside the Ark of the Covenant. But they're throwing those crowns, those mitres that you find in the 28th chapter of Exodus down at the feet of Jesus and they're submitting to him as the high priest, no longer a Aaronic high priesthood, but a Melchizedek priesthood saying, only you can interpret the book. I believe that the book that we find here that's written on our hearts is the same as the seven stars in his right hand and it's the same book that's sealed with seven seals in his right hand. And any official seal, any official sealed book, if it is opened uh, unlawfully or by someone who is unworthy, uh, the penalty would be death. So they say, we throw our crowns at your feet, these crowns of the high priest, they wore a gold crown on a gold mitre over their head that said holiness to the Lord. We throw them at the feet of Jesus and say only you are able to open the book of men's hearts. And of course this is being opened in the sixth chapter. And the four beasts open the books. And we talked about the four beasts out of the fourth chapter these four beasts are the four cherubim, and you had four cherubim inside the Holy of Holies. You had one on each end of the Ark of the Covenant and two embroidered inside that, uh, the, that veil. It was about eight inches thick. So you got four beasts in there, and each one of them has four faces. Now, I don't know whether each one of them had, one had the face of a, of a lion, the other has the face of a man, the other has the face of an eagle, and the other has the face of an ox. I don't know whether it was that way or whether they had 
four faces. And of course, these four-faced beasts, that goes back to Genesis, the ninth chapter, where God forms His covenant with these four, with the fowl of the air, with the fowl, and the king of the fowl is the eagle, and with, uh, with the beast of the field, and the king of the beast is the lion, and with uh, the cattle of the field, and the king of the cattle is the ox, and with man, with man, and each one had the face of a man, the face of an ox, the face of a lion, the face of an eagle. And you find those throughout the first part of Ezekiel, especially the first chapter, and then get over into the tenth chapter. The first and second chapter and the tenth chapter, you see these cherubim are first four beasts. Now this is, when you see these beasts, you just think covenant. Covenant. Because what they do, when you see them, you're seeing God's protective covenant. That's what he said to Noah. Well, let's read it one more time over there in Genesis 9. Genesis 9, in case you weren't here, in case you hadn't heard this before. Genesis, the ninth chapter. And wherever you see one thing in the Scripture, you're going to find it everywhere else. Now look here. Genesis 9, verse 9, and, be, and I behold, I establish my covenant with you, Noah, and that's man, and with your seed after you, and with every living creature that is with you of the fowl, and the eagle represents the fowl, of the cattle, the king of the cattle is the ox, representing the cattle, and of every beast of the earth, the king of the beast is the lion. With you from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth. And I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of the flood. Neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature the fowl, the beast, the cattle, and man that is with you for perpetual generations. So since it's a perpetual covenant, when you find these four beasts, you find the protective covenant of God. Not that He's going to protect our bodies. We're not to fear Him that can destroy the body, but we're, here, we're to fear Him that can destroy both soul and body in hell. If we die in this life, we go be with the Lord. And we're protected forever. Now, the protection of God's people, we find, is shown by His mark or by His seal. Let me give you the word seal. Let me give you the word, se the word seal. Let me erase some of this. And I don't know how to explain this other than just giving you a little at a time and jump in wherever I can because there's so much to this. And as we study sevens, and keep remembering to be sevened, and these are all, this is all, these, these chapters here, you find the end of time in all these chapters. So this is just a different viewpoint from Revelation 6, and here's Revelation 8. It's a different way to look at these. It's like he said, Fabern said, it's like a political cartoon. And it's, that's one of the best ways to describe the book of Revelation. When you see a beast with seven heads and a ten horns and a harlot sitting up on the heads, that's a cartoon. It's what it is. doesn't mean there's a literal beast with seven heads and ten horns. It doesn't literally mean they got seven crowns upon the horns. Crowns denote power and authority. Horns denote power. You have to go back and find out what these things mean. It's one big political cartoon is what the book of Revelation is. Now, let me give you this. Here is the word, here's the word seal. It's the word sfragizo, to seal something. S-P-H-R-A-G-I-Z-O. Sfragizo, and it comes from sfragis, S P H. R-A-G-I-S. And sfragizo has the idea to stamp. 
to stamp. Or to, it's a private mark. Now, the way they would seal these scrolls, a book wasn't a bad book that was bound that you opened up. It was a scroll. And when they would seal these, the king had a signet. He had a signet ring. And we get our word, S-I-G-N-A-T-U-R-E. What they would do is they would stamp that signet ring in hot wax or in clay, and they would seal that on that rolled up scroll. And if you didn't have the authority, that's why they were saying, who is worthy to open? Who can do this legally? Who can open the scroll? And there was one found in heaven with seven horns and seven eyes in the fifth chapter of Revelation. He is worthy to open it. He can legally open this book. But you couldn't open the book if you broke a seal of a if you broke the seal of the Roman government, no matter how unimportant the message was, you would pay with your life. So people didn't go around just opening seals. And, of course, the word sphragis, this means a signet as fencing. As fencing or in protecting from misappropriation. It means to protect from misappropriating for anything that would, uh, that would deter the work from doing what it's supposed to do. Now, the Bible speaks of us being sealed, and it also means to keep secret, to keep secret. Well, what would what, what is a secret? A mystery, and a mystery. You got the mystery of Christ, and to most people, what we see about the truth is a mystery, isn't it? Yes. It's a mystery. They can't see it. They don't understand. It's a mystery and it's as though we're in some kind of club and we are. It's called the elect of God. We are in a secret club and we've been initiated into it and God has circumcised our heart and written His Word on fleshy tables of the heart and it is a secret. The word mystery is the word M-U-S-T-E-R-I-O-N Mosturian and it, it comes from muo meaning to shut the mouth and Mosturian means something that's the facts are unrevealed to everyone. We can see the truth about sin, but they can't see the truth about us. They can't even see the truth about the Word of God. They can call themselves a Christian and carry a Bible, and they can't see it. So when the Bible speaks of being sealed, that's this word sphragis. And it, has, it means to stamp and impress something as a mark of privacy or genuineness means to stamp stamp something that is genuine genuineness reminds me of a touchstone a touchstone in fact the word torment when the scorpions of revelation 9 sting that they will not torment us the word torment comes from a word that means touchstone. A touchstone is a stone that you use to rub on something to see if it is real or not. And we, and we, have, and we are real and God is a touchstone and he, is not, and he has not revealed us to them, but the sting of the scorpion will not hurt us and scorpions are false teachers. Now let's go back over here and look at chapter 7. Let's look at chapter 7. Chapter 7 and chapter 14 go together because you've got the Bible mentioning 12,000 out of each tribe here in chapter 7 and you've got 12,000 out of 12 tribes would be 144,000, wouldn't it? Well, when you get over here in Revelation the 14th chapter, you've got the 144,000. Let's go over there first before we come back to chapter uh, 7. Go to chapter 14. Now, the stupidest things I've ever heard have been said 
about the 144,000 and who they are. Well, the Jews say, uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses say there's 144,000 people going to be saved and get to go to heaven and they're all uh, top-notch Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, there's lesser Jehovah's Witnesses that don't get to be part of the 144,000, but they get to be saved through eternity and live on the earth, but the 144,000 get to go up somewhere to be with God. I don't know where in the world they get that out of this. It's the biggest bunch of foolishness. And then when you get around some independent Baptist, say the 144,000, 144,000 Jews that are going to witness and testify. That's what I got to say to that. That's an Archie Bunker answer, you know. Yeah. It's just dumb. The Bible tells you who the 144,000 are. It's as plain as the nose on your face if you pay attention. Let's read here. Chapter 14, and this ties with the 12,000 out of each tribe in chapter 7. Let's read. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him an hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Now, we're going to be sealed in the forehead. Where did all this sealing in the head and in the arm come from? It comes from the Old Testament, particularly Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter. Let's go back over there. Go back to Deuteronomy 6. In the old ancient world, when you see anyone being sealed, if a man stayed, if he was, if he was an indentured servant and he was indentured to a man and he was a bond slave, if he was there to be a slave for a debt that his father owed and he stayed the full time if it was seven years uh, and he was forgiven the debt or even if he come up to the year of Jubilee where it was required that all debts were forgiven this man would sometimes be marked in his forehead or he would have his ear bored through with an awl and he would go up to the side of the door if he wanted to stay in that master's family because he was a fair man and he would have his ear bored through with an awl that was a little punch, then they could say he belonged to this man. He had the man's authority on him. Sometimes they would have a sign put up on their forehead or their hand. And they get this out of Deuteronomy, the 26th chapter. You remember the harlot uh, upon her forehead was a name written, mystery, comma, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. Well, all of the harlots back in that day and time, they had a band around their head and it told you on that band who they served, who owned them, and who got the funds out of their fornication that they went out and they did their tricks. This told you who owned them, who their pimp was. That's what it actually meant. Uh, who, they, who they worked for. Mystery. Babylon the Great. That's who I worked for. Now, that was in the forehead. Sometimes when a young man would go away uh, to war, a mother would have, have uh, something, her son's name, engraved in the palm of her hands. And God says, I have engraved you in the palm of my hand. That was a very common thing for people to do. And the woman could look at that either that picture, that mark that she had engraved and think of her son. God looks at, he said, I've engraved you in the palm of my hand, so I think of you all the time. Well, all these markings, there were many of them, and most of the scholars will tell you that it comes out of, it actually comes out of the book of Deuteronomy, everything everybody gets. When the Assyrians came up with all these cherubim in their cylinders and on their great monuments, it's believed they took this from Israel when they carried Israel into captivity. Now, look over here in Deuteronomy 6. This is where most of this starts. It's with the law of God. When you find it mixed up among the heathens, they picked it up from Israel. And Israel did pick up some things. But here in Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, 
And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Now we know that God's writing his word on fleshy tables of the heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way and when thou liest down and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand. Now, you think of the mark of the beast being on the hand. And think of it being before the eye. And they shall be as frontless between thine eyes. Well, that's where the mark of the beast is going to be. And the Jews really corrupted this. And they put phylacteries on their hands on their left hand because they said it was closest to their heart and they put it in a little box right in front of their eyes and, and if, when they wanted to really impress somebody they would enlarge the phylactery and put a great big black box on their forehead carry a great big bible that's the way you do you carry a big bible and they would enlarge the phylactery and they'd wrap it around and around their arm there and they'd carry it on their arm and it, this is one of the verses it had in there. They'd say see I got the word of God on my arm. What's in it? Well I don't know but I believe it. That's kind of the way people do their Bibles. Thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand. Thou shalt be as frontless between thine eyes. That doesn't mean put them in a little box or mark a man between the eyes. When you have the mark of the beast, when we have the mark of God and we're sealed the sealing of God is putting His Word before our eyes. It means in our minds. Whatever our hand finds to do, we do it with all of our might. We do it all to the glory of God and we do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what our hand does. And when we lift up holy hands, it doesn't mean to raise them up in the air and get a touchdown when you get both of them up there. I'm holding one of my pages. Touchdown. No, that's not Pentecostalism. God is not worshipped with men's hands there in the 17th chapter of Acts. Lifting up holy hands means to have a holy heart and reaching out doing the work of God. It don't mean raise your hands straight up in the air and wave them. And he says, Thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house. That's called a mezuzah. They take these same words... Put it inside of a mezuzah. I don't know if y'all ever noticed. I got a mezuzah on the inside door of my front door of my house. They put it on the right side of the door on the inside. I got mine on the left side just to be a little rebellious. A guy, I sold a house to a Jew one time and he gave me a mezuzah. I just went ahead and stuck it on the inside of the door of my house. TBM was given for a love gift. Yeah. Yeah. Thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and thy gates, and it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land, which he sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities, which thou buildest not, and the houses full of all good things, which thou fillest not, and wells digged with thy, which thou diggest not, Vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not, when thou shalt have eaten and be full, then beware lest thou forget the Lord. Be beware, have his law written before your eyes. So when the Bible is talking about sealing God's family, go back to Revelation. It's talking about sealing God's family in Revelation, the seventh chapter. He's talking about putting his word in our mind. When you take the mark of the beast, you take it in your mind. It's not a computer chip. Computer chips are outdated because we got something that's better than a computer chip. Now it's called DNA. I mean, computer chips way behind DNA, isn't it? So they can mark and find out where everybody in the world is. They got these new fangled ways to get in companies. You go in there and you stick your thumb in there. 
or you stick your certain finger in there and that opens the door for you. The American government had some of Saddam Hussein's DNA. That's how they found out they swabbed his mouth when they called him. Yeah. They said, yeah, it matches up with God. They wanted to make sure it wasn't one of his doubles. Yeah, that's good. So when you're talking about Mark of the Beast, that's taking the law of the beast. The beast was in the garden. The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. And when the Lord said, you can eat of the trees over here, but you can't go over here and eat of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and that's the Christmas tree. That's the tree worship that they re-began at, and, uh, at Babel. He said, you can eat over here, but don't go beyond the stake on the boundary line. That takes us to the mark. The word seal and mark are synonymous terms because don't go to the stake or to the karagma, C-H-A-R-A-G-M-A. It comes from the word C-H-A-R-A-X, which means a stake, a stake or a palisade or a rampart. It's something on a boundary. Don't go beyond the stake on the boundary line. And over in Hosea, the Bible says that Judah was like those who had moved the bound. They moved the bound to take in the tree, all that's in the world. So don't go beyond the stake. The mark of the beast was in the garden. That was the stake you don't go beyond. Here's the law of God. Here is your mark. Here is God's law. The word law is the word nomos in the Greek, and it means legal food. Here's what you can eat of. When you go eating unlawfully, remember the word anomia? A-N-O-M-I-A. When the Bible says sin is the transgression of the law, sin is the transgression of the law. The word transgression is the word anomia. It comes from the word nomos, nomos, and the alpha privative first letter of the Greek alphabet, it means nomos is the word means legal food. That started in the garden, placing the alpha privity, the first letter of the Greek alphabet as a negative particle and negates the word, gives an opposite meaning. It means no legal food. It means unlawful. That started in the garden, didn't it? That's where it started. So the mark of the beast is over here. God's seal started in the garden. He says, put my law before your eyes. Now we'll get back to that in a minute. I got a hundred places to go from here. <clears throat> so sin is the transgression of the law. When you take the mark of the beast, you go beyond the boundary and you eat unlawfully. What is it that we eat of? We eat of the tree, all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's the mark of the beast, not a computer chip. And I've had Christians say, oh, but what if they make me take the mark? What if, what if they put in there and force me? Then I have to go to hell. <laughs> that's, that's really so ridiculous, it's funny. Go back over here. We got to... We've got to finish seeing chapter 14, verse 1. And having the Father's name written in their foreheads. The Father's what? Authority. Authority. Onoma. Father's authority. The Father's law written in their minds. God's law, God's word. The 144,000 are the ones that are sealed because you got 12,000 out of each tribe. I have heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of great thunder and I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps and they sung as it were a new song before the throne. Remember the throne is... Remember the throne. What's the throne? Ark of the Covenant. That's where God sat. Ark of the Covenant. You notice you can't find any answers unless you go to the Old Testament. That's where all your answers are. Well, 
here's the, the temple, here's the veil, seven candlesticks, the altar of incense, table of showbread on the north, there's the ark of the covenant. That was the throne where God sat. And the four beasts, you had a beast here, one here, and two embroidered into the curtain. Look what it says. I heard a voice from heaven, and Israel was called the heavens, as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps, and they sung as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts. What are the four beasts? You got the four beasts. The four beasts, anytime you see four angels... Are these four beasts, they're the ones with the face of a lion, the face of an ox, the face of a man, and the face of the eagle. This is the four beasts. This is God's covenant with His people. And the elders, that's the 24 elders, that's the 24 sons of Aaron. And no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed. Who is it that's been redeemed and bought? The church. The church. Now, verse 4 will tell you who the 144,000 are. It just amazes me why everybody misses this. These are they which were not defiled with women. Someone that's not defiled with women is... Called a virgin, isn't it? Isn't it? Huh? A virgin. Well, the church is going to be forgiven and declared to be a virgin. Look at 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 11 and 1. 11. This is Paul writing. Would to God you would bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. He's talking to the Corinthian church. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So one who is not defiled with women is a virgin, and that's the church. And God will forgive us of sin and He's going to leave these old fleshly bodies behind, take this perfect man that's in us that cannot sin. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. The virgin in us is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the inner man that doesn't sin. Now let's go back to the 14th chapter. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. That is the virgin church, the pure church. These are, it tells you who they are. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. He says, follow me. I haven't looked at the word follow. It's probably akulatheo. I'll tell you what I can do. I can look it up. Wait a minute. Is anybody... Yeah. Let's just look it up. I hadn't looked at it. If it's Akulatheo, I like that. Follow. All right. If... I think this is worth looking up. If... F O F O L L O W. Follow. Okay. Revelation. Which follow? Okay. 190. Aha! <laughs> hey, isn't that good? A K O L O U. This just verifies this much more. A-K-O-L-O-U-T-H-E-O. -O -E Wonderful! These are those which follow the Lamb. Luke 9, 23. If any man will come after me, 
let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. That word akulatheo in Luke 9.23 is imperative mood. Anyone who is following Christ is taking his cross and dying daily. This word means to be, to be in the same way with. That's what the word akulatheo, the word way, what is the way? It is narrow. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the way. So Jesus is the hodos. And he said, you got two ways, a narrow way, a narrow way, a narrow hodos, and a broad hodos. And those who are following Christ have been commanded to be in the way. So when you define this word, they follow the Lamb because they're taking their cross and dying daily. The only ones following the Lamb are the ones who have been demanded to get in the narrow way. That is the word thalibo, T-H-L-I-B-O. And that word thalibo means to go through a narrow opening. It comes from thalipsis. That word is the common word for affliction or tribulation all the way through the New Testament. We must through much thalipsis, tribulation, enter the kingdom of God. So these that are following Christ, this is the church. Twelve is the number of the, of the total church. Seven is the number of the baptized or completed church or the sevened church. So these follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. Who is following Christ? The ones taking their cross and dying daily, right? That's not even hard, is it? And then he tells you, These were redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits. Huh. That tells you exactly who they are, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. What are we predestined to? For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he be the firstborn among many brethren. The firstborn of the body was called the first fruits of the body. Hmm. So we're the first fruits, aren't we? Well, look at James 1.18. Go back to James 1.18. James 1. If people would define words, this won't be that hard. Right? See, that just thrills me to... I figured that was Akulatheo. Because when you find those that are following Christ, it's always Akulatheo. And that's a command... So everybody that is akulatheo in the same way with Christ, they're in the tribulation, they're in the fiery trials. So the 144,000 is a picture of the believers? Yes. The picture of the believers. That's all it is. Look here. Look here in, in James 1 verse 18. Of his own will, not by our will, beget he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Aren't we first fruits? And the first fruits of the crop of the land that came in, came in in Nisan, came in Nisan, and that was the barley harvest or the bread crop. And in 50 days later, came in the wheat harvest. This was the first. First fruits means actually the first part of any crop. The first. Uh, apples on a tree, the first figs on a tree, the first grapes. Those were first fruits. But actually the first fruit that came into the land was the bread crop. And what, that's us, isn't it? We being many are one bread and one body. So this is not something hard. You've got to define some words. Being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. Then he starts describing what we're supposed to be 
For there, in their mouth was found no guile, no trickery. When we start saying truth and living in truth, we don't live by trickery. The word is dolos. It means to speak by trickery. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. And that's us. Because we have an inner man that can't sin and he's going to give us a new body to go with our new soul, with our new spirit one day. Now, besides that, 12 is the number of the church. Go back here to John 6. It's the number of the total church. John, the sixth chapter. How many tribes of Israel were there? There were 12 tribes. The 13th was Levi. How many... How many... Apostles were there. There were twelve, and the thirteenth was Paul. He was one born out of due time, but twelve is the number of the total church. Look over here in chapter six of John, verse four, the Passover, a feast of the Jews was nigh. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and saw the great multitude. I saw the great company come unto him. He saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he knew, he himself knew what he would do. And Philip answered, Two hundred penny worth. A penny was a denarius. And a denarius was a day's wages for a Roman soldier. It was a day's wages for a field hand or a slave. And it would buy... It would buy one measure of wheat for a day, a penny would, or three measures of barley. A measure would feed a man one meal. So they had 300 penny worth. If they bought barley, they had enough feed for 900 people. That's it. Now there were 5,000 here plus women and children. That was approximately 15,000 or more. So they had enough for 900 people. And some of these Pentecostals say, well, they had enough for, uh, to buy all. No, they didn't, you dummies. Pa Philip answered him, 200 penny worth bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are they among so many? And Jesus said, Make the men sit down. And there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down in number about 5,000. Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes as much as wood. Then they were filled, he said unto the disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. And remember, we're the bread, we being many are one bread and one body. Therefore they gathered them together and filled twelve baskets so none would be lost. That's the number of the total church. Twelve. 12,000 out of each tribe. 12 times 12 is 144. And then you've got 12 disciples and 12 tribes. It's the number of the total church. Filled 12 baskets with fragments of five barley loaves which remained over and above unto them that had eaten so that none would be lost in verse 12. And in the same context of Scripture, read 37, 38, and 39. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. Here's predestination. That's the total church. And him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing. None of the twelve will be lost. But should raise it up again at the last day. Now let's go back over here. Now twelve is the number of the total church, and seven is the number of the refined church. How much time do I have? Six minutes. Ah, I need more time. Let's go back to the seventh chapter. Seventh chapter of Revelation. <clears throat> I don't know how to give this to you. 
I've studied this for years and years and years. And just, just like, this is mathematics. It's basic mathematics. You define all the parts of speech and the places and you find it. It's the same thing when Mike goes to teach math and he gives all the parts to the problem. He write, you just write everything down. What you do? You look everywhere you can find something sealed or marked. And you look everywhere where you can find 12. Look everywhere where you can find 7. And when you do this, and look up the word first fruits and firstborn. If you'll go into even the encyclopedia, Zonovan's Pictorial Encyclopedia, they'll tell you, look up first fruit and firstborn. They'll tell you that the first fruit of the body, the one that opened the matrix, was said to be, the firstborn was said to be the first fruits of the body. Now, I don't have time to go back to all of that. I, I've got so many places in the Old Testament I would like to go to, and we might come back and touch on that. Now, look here. Chapter 7. You got 12,000 out of each tribe. There's only one thing wrong here. This is an improper numbering of Israel, mainly because of several things, and I'll read through it. Look at chapter 7, verse 1. After these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth. When you got four angels, what are they? We're not talking about seven angels. We're talking about the four. An angel is a messenger of God. Where do we find four angels? Huh? How about the four beasts? They're messengers of God, aren't they? With the face of the man, with the face of the lion, the face of the ox and the face of the eagle. These are the same four beasts or four angels that opened the first four seals in the previous chapter. Aren't, isn't this a picture of the covenant of God? Who better to mark and seal God's people than the sign of the covenant? Who, who, who would be more in the context of this allegorical picture who would be more to write upon our foreheads and upon our arms where we rise up, where we lie down, where we walk than the keepers of the covenant? After these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth holding the four winds of the earth. The reason they said four corners is they believed the earth was flat and you had a corner up here and a corner here and a corner up here and a corner here. That's real simple. That's what they believed back in that day and time. <clears throat> Holding the four winds of the earth, they had a north wind and a south wind, east wind and west wind. And that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, the Sphragis, to protect us. You remember that? The word Sphragis means a protection. It means something to seal or sign and put a mark on and he's going to wrap us up and protect us. What protects us is the mark of God in our foreheads. It's his word in our minds. When you get to the mark of the beast in the 13th chapter, that's that word karagma. It comes from karax, meaning it means a stake on a boundary line. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea and saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. What does that mean? What does that mean? Let's put the word of God there. Have the word of God in our minds, in the forehead. It's not talking about computer chips. That's so dumb. And I heard the number of them that were sealed, and there were sealed 144,000 of the tribes of the children of Israel. Who is spiritual Israel now? Who is Mount Zion, heavenly Jerusalem of the church of the firstborn? It's us, the church. Who's circumcised of the heart? We are. Who's priest and kings? We are. Who's the temple of God? We are. Who is Israel? 
God said His Israel are those that walk according to the new creation in the 6th chapter of Galatians. He said, Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision availeth anything but a new creation. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them and upon the Israel of God. They are not all Israel which are of Israel. The election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. So Israel is those who've got the spiritual mark of God before their eyes, in their minds. Let's continue reading. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Reuben were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Gad were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Asher were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Naphtali were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Manasseh were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Simeon were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Levi were sealed 12,000. There's only one thing wrong with this. Levi was never numbered with Israel. Never. This is an improper numbering for literal Israel. I'll show you in a moment. Of the tribe of Issachar were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Zebulun were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Joseph, Joseph had two tribes, but we've already named Manasseh up here in verse 6. Of the tribe of Joseph were sealed 12,000, so he could only be talking about Ephraim here. Of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed 12,000, and that's it. And Dan is left completely out. And Levi was named, and Levi was never numbered with Israel. Look one more time with me. Dan always had a part. The only thing I can tell you is the reason God did this. This is a picture of the church. It's not a picture. Now, people say, well, Dan wasn't numbered because they got real evil. You mean more evil than the rest of Israel that God destroyed for going after Baal in the grove? No. It's not true. They weren't more any more evil than Benjamin. I mean, Benjamin just got ornery and mean as a bunch of snakes. Look over here. Go back over here to Numbers 1. Go to Numbers, the first chapter. Do I have any time? No. Well, I'll just give you this, and I'll quit. But I'll come back to this. Numbers, first chapter. I'll give you this, and we'll... First chapter, huh. God is numbering Israel. Look at verse 44. These are those that were numbered, which Moses and Aaron numbered. And he's numbered all through here. Let me just show you. If you back up and look at, uh, if you look up here. Verse 22, of the children of Simeon. Verse 24, of the children of Gad. Verse 26, of the children of Judah. Verse 28, of the children of Issachar. He's numbering them. Verse 30, of the children of Zebulun. Verse 32, of the children of Joseph. Namely, the children of Ephraim. Verse 34, of the children of Manasseh. Verse 36, of the children of Benjamin. Verse 38, of the children of Dan. Verse 40, of the children of Asher. Verse 42, of the children of Naphtali. And then read with me in verse 44. These are those that were numbered, which Moses and Aaron numbered, and the princes of Israel being twelve men, each one for the house of his fathers. So were all those that were numbered of the children of Israel by the house of their fathers from twenty years old and upward, all that were able to go forth to war in Israel. Though that was draft age. Even all that were numbered were 600,000 and 3,550. But the Levites, after the tribe of their fathers, were not numbered among them. And the Lord had spoken unto Moses, saying, Only thou shalt not number the tribe of Levi, neither take the sum of them among the children of Israel, 
but thou shalt appoint the Levites over the tabernacle of the testimony, over the vessels thereof. They'll bear the tabernacle, and they're not numbered with Israel. And if you look at Numbers 26, Numbers 26, they were never numbered. This is not talking about it. It's talking about a spiritual Israel. Numbers 26 in verse 62. Numbers 26. Those that were numbered of them were twenty and three thousand, all males from a month old and upward, for they were not numbered among the children of Israel because there was no inheritance given unto them among the children of Israel, speaking of the Levites. They were not numbered ever. And when you get into the eighth chapter of Numbers, God says, give me, your, give me the Levites instead of the firstborn. And he gave the extra tribe to Israel by splitting the tribe of southern Judah. Uh, I'm excusing by splitting uh, Joseph's tribe into Ephraim and Manasseh that made 13 tribes. So he said the Levites won't be numbered. 12 was the number of the complete church or uh, not complete, but total Israel. That was the total number. And Dan, you're going to find in Joshua 19 and 48, in Ezekiel in 48 and 1, that Dan had a portion in Israel. Dan is not numbered here in this seventh chapter. This is a picture of spiritual Israel. And it goes on down in that same seventh chapter to talk about all those that were clothed in white robes around the throne. And the angels asked John, says, do you know what these are? And he said, no. He said, these are those who have made their robes white in the blood of Christ. Christ. That's the true Israel of God. So when you get into the 144,000, it has nothing to do with 144,000 literal Jews or 144,000 Jehovah's Witnesses. The Bible plainly states who it is. It's those that follow Jesus. They've been redeemed. They're in the same way with Christ. Well, I'm out of time. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and for truth. God, help us to continue the study of this book. Lord, all I know to do is pitch some here and some there and show what I've learned up to this point. Lord, help me to learn more about this book to be able to teach your sheep so we can see these truths. God, we pray that you'll come soon. Forgive us where we fail. Fight our battles for us. Give us sufficient health that we can stay with the sheep to teach for if it's according to your mercy and your will for a long time to come because, Lord, they're in need. Deal with our hearts and our lives. Crush us. And God will give you praise in Christ's name. Amen.